Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Northwest Craftsman. If you're watching this video, it's because you wanna learn a little bit about how to make a table like this and not make the same mistakes that it did or to use the same techniques that I had that worked really well. In today's video, it's gonna be a little bit more informational, but I wanted to go through real quickly and talk about the things that I learned, the do's and don'ts of making this table so that hopefully you guys can make a better one when you make one yourself. All right, let's get going. All righty, so number one, when you're dimensioning your lumber at the very beginning of the project, make sure to leave your yourself plenty of margin on either end of your board because when I was rough cross cutting them to get them about the right length that I needed and then I ran them through my jointer, my planer, my table saw to get them square and parallel, what I ran into was that the initial cuts that I took on my miter saw were not datumed off of the same surfaces that ended up on the final pieces of wood so I ended up with angles which caused gaps in my surface. Here's what they look like when I finally trimmed them up to make them right. All right, so if you can see this dark line right here, that is because I had to cut more off of this portion of uh, the walnut right here, and it left a little bit of a gap because everything was already cut to length, and so I just had to figure out where to put the gap, and so I tried to balance this gap with everything else. Here's another example of a gap. Um, you can see this one right here. So it wasn't the end of the world because I figured out a way to fill them, but if you can make sure that you account for that extra and do one final cross cut at the end using your miter saw, um, you can get everything to the right length. I just misjudged how much it was gonna come out of true from the initial cut that I had. Alrighty, and that brings us to number two, filling gaps. One of the issues that I ran into on this project is that some of those larger gaps I didn't fill ahead of time. I had figured the epoxy was gonna be thick enough when I poured it that it was gonna fill it, and by the time I did a second coat, it would have a perfect surface. And on some of them, that was true, but on some of them, it wasn't. And you've gotta find a way to get around this. So I'm just recommending that you fill every gap that you have in the surface that you're going to be epoxying from the start so that you don't run into this issue of the epoxy just leaking down out of that crack to the bottom. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. You can use wood glue and sawdust to get it to somewhat match the wood that you have. On the maple portions, I filled the gaps with a stainable wood filler that roughly matched the uh, color of the maple. And so it took the stain pretty well. And so it's less distracting in the end than having something like straight wood glue or straight epoxy that's not gonna take any stain at all. And that's one of the things you also have to be concerned about on uh, walnut is that it's a very dark wood. And so if you get something that's gonna be pretty bright, it's gonna pop right at those seams. Now that may be an effect that you want. It may not be an effect that you want, but find a way to fill these wood gaps that match is the final look that you're going for because the epoxy especially on a float coat does not do a great job of filling in all those gaps without doing a lot of extra work on it now if you're looking to play the game a little bit risky i did have some luck when i waited for the tabletop epoxy to somewhat set up so it was kind of a thick uh, honey consistency when I got done with it. It was actually probably like cold molasses consistency. Um, so very, very, very stiff. Um, I was able to take a tongue depressor and basically spoon it into the gaps right there to fill it. And at that point, it was thick enough that it didn't bleed through. But it was still at a place that when I torched it lightly, it would blend nicely with the edges that I had. So if you want to do that, it's kind of risky because you got to get your viscosity just right on the epoxy. I recommend just filling before you do the epoxy at all. Alrighty, and that leads us to number three. So one of the issues that I ran into, if you watched my glue up video, was the fact that I failed my first glue up and I had to yank everything apart before the glue set up. It was an absolute fiasco. And that's because I was trying to glue every single board edge individually and I already had my dominoes installed. So my recommendation if you're doing a table like this is unless you're very specifically going for the look of uneven board widths, I would have every board exactly the same width and then you basically put all the faces together and glue that at the same time because it allows you to very quickly use a roller, a brush, or something to roll right over the seams that are going to be glued all the way around. And it allows you to take a lot of that time that you would spend trying to spread the glue and allow you to position things. So it just adds a lot of margin to your time. So again, if you can cut every board the same width so that during your glue up, you can glue all of your faces at the same time, absolutely recommend it. And again, speaking of glue ups, number four, always, 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 always do a dry fit. I had one issue during that glue up. This was the issue with that glue up. Um, not because I didn't have enough margin with the spreading the glue around, but it's because I didn't do a dry fit. And so one of my boards that was right in the middle and was the only symmetrical board that I had in the entire design was flipped 180 degrees. So my dominoes didn't even come close to coming together on it. And so I was trimming tenons and I was trimming the dominoes and trimming all sorts of stuff to try and get it to fit. And that's just not the way you want to do it. So 
always do a dry fit of your pieces together before you do the glue up. It is only gonna take you about 20 or 30 minutes to get it all put together, but you are going to thank yourself because you will catch mistakes that you would have to do in a time crunched glue up situation, and that's just no place to be trying to make changes. Alrighty, number five, staining. So one of the things that I always saw in the staining cans that I never really took into account was using a lint-free rag or a t-shirt. Now, I've always just used a brush because all of my pieces have been pretty small, but on this one, the problem that I ran into is that when you're spreading stain, you want to make sure that you're spreading it and wiping away the excess before it dries. Well, if I'm trying to paint the entire surface of this table, um, it was going to be a long time before I got back to the starting area and I didn't want to stain in patches because I didn't want to get kind of a patchwork appearance. The benefit to staining with a t-shirt is that once the t-shirt is totally saturated, uh, it is so easy to apply a thin layer of stain and it's effectively as much stain as the wood needs in that mark. You can always go back over it to get a little bit darker, back over it again to get a little bit darker before everything dries and then you're going to run over with a dry t-shirt to wipe off any of the little bits of excess that are there but you're basically just spoon feeding the wood as much stain as it needs to get to the color that you want and if you've got a spot that needs a little bit more apply just a little bit more pressure and more stain will come out of that area absolutely love this method for anything that's bigger than like a 12 by 20 cutting board which i don't stain my cutting boards but about that size 12 by 20 kind of handheld I'm probably gonna use the t-shirt method from now on. Next lesson is to make your seal coat a uniform thickness. Now again, this is the final coat on the table, but this board in particularly, I'm not sure if it's because it was the heartwood. Um, I actually need to confirm, but I believe this is the heartwood of the maple. Um, but this was so freaking bubbly all the way through the process. It was super frustrating. And the seal coat that I had put on there got most of them uh, trapped in that base layer, but because it was too thin in some spots, bubbles continued to come through. Now, I don't know if you guys can see it in the light, but there are still some, yep, there you go there's a couple you can still see a couple that came through even in the end after i had my seal coat because where there's a bubble that goes all the way down to the wood even if you sand over the top of that you need to very specifically fill that void otherwise air can make its way all the way from the wood back out and that's exactly what i saw even in the final coat is that some of those areas some of those voids that I had still were producing bubbles, but I could have fixed all of that had I had a uniform seal coat thickness that I was really careful about policing bubbles up on, or if it's th small enough, thin enough, you just leave the bubbles in there. You can't even see them on the surface of the wood and then you get to go the epoxy right over the top of it, but it's already sealed because of the seal coat. Another comment on laying the epoxy down is to make sure that you wait long enough to do your second seal coat. One of the things that I noticed over here when I was doing that thin seal coat is that I didn't wait long enough on the seal coat, and so bubbles could come through the old seal coat into the new coat, the float coat that I had on top of it, causing me major issues. So you really wanna make sure that you wait long enough for it to be tacky enough where you'll still get a chemical bond between the two layers. And again, follow the directions on the epoxy that you're using with the super clear. It was that kind of like bar room after a college beer garden uh, type of tacky. And I was just a little bit aggressive with trying to put the float coat on. So it just didn't work. Now, if you can't wait for that, or you don't wanna try and make that window or try and finagle it, it is not hard to do a mechanical finish all the way across. I went through and I sanded this entire thing down in probably a half hour with my Orbital sander and it looks just beautiful. So I only did 120 all the way across. It worked perfectly. It was everything that I needed. And it was a lot easier when I was spreading because when I had that spreader running across the surface, I didn't have to worry about gouging the surface underneath it because of the spikes or because of the trowel uh, divots that were on my spreader. Because once it's hard, it's hard. And so I was able to basically put that spreader right on that surface on the bottom, scrape it right across the surface. And it was a much better feel as I was spreading the epoxy. So I may just wait if I've got the time to do the mechanical bond between layers because I much appreciated or much preferred the spreading experience on a mechanical bond versus on the chemical bond. Okay, the next one is when you're using a spreader, you wanna use a better quality spreader than I had. I used some of these Warner 1 8 of an inch notched spreaders and there was two different reasons why I had issues. One was these corners here left streaks in my table. So I don't know what it was about the design that left the streaks, but they left streaks in my table and I think I, I don't know, but I'm not going to be using these in the future. This was an absolute pain in the butt. And then the other one is even though you've got a 1 8 inch notch all the way across, here's the problem you run into. So if you've got notch at 1 8, notch at 1 8 with a 1 8 inch, 1 8 inch valley, that's going to be where your epoxy fills. Well, that's all fine and dandy, except now you've got an empty valley right next to it. So if you've got a 1 8 of an inch notch, when it evens out that surface, when this notch to the top notch is touching the bottom, 
uh, you're going to get 1 16th. You effectively get half the height that you have there. So when I was told by, ta uh, by uh, Super Clear that I can do a quarter inch max all the way across here, even if I was to use a quarter inch trowel, I am still only going to get 1 8th of an inch. Now the way that you get around that is if you've got thinner notches and so it cuts it off at a quarter inches, but it's got smaller valleys to fill in in the end. Anyways, better get get a better quality notched spreader, adhesive spreader than I had. Um, here's just an example of one of the pieces that I cut off and you can see how, let me autofocus on that real fast. Um, if you look on the top right there, that is about 1 16th of an inch and that is after a seal coat and that is after two float coats over the top of this. Um, yeah, I was not expecting it to be nearly that thin. So I do have a layer on there, but it is not the quarter inch that I was hoping that it would be. Okay, and this one is going to be a little bit more of a subtle defect in the table that you only can notice if you're in quite the right light. So watch this light right here. As I move across this board, you'll notice kind of a ripple in it right there. And if you go up, you can see it float all the way down the table. And then back, you can see it come down. See how it just kind of follows like that? From everything that I can find online, that is caused by I, one of two things. One, um, I blowtorched too aggressively in this area, and so it actually spread the epoxy out, and so I get this kind of weird ripply pattern. You can barely feel it, but you can see it when you're in the right light. When you're off at not the right light, it's basically impossible to tell that it's there. But when you have the right light, it pops out like a sore thumb. So don't over torch your epoxy when you're going across it very very lightly pass over your epoxy but then also um, i can't tell if it was because there was temperature fluctuations in my shop or if it was because of the torch both of them i need to work on but try to keep your shop space at a uniform temperature within a couple of degrees of each other and make sure that there's no like cold drafts or anything coming through here i'm trying to build this in the middle of winter in an outdoor detached shop which makes it a little bit more difficult especially when i've got two space heaters that try to keep it up to temperature and a wood stove which heats from one end of the space to the other. So my temperature, my space was not thermally uniform like it should have been, and I was probably blowtorching a little bit more aggressively than I ought to have because I was trying to avoid the bubbling issue that I got over here. So just heads up on stuff like that. Also, if you've done epoxy before and you know exactly what that defect is from, I would absolutely love to hear from you because I want to make sure that that can't happen again. Okay, so this one may be a little bit harder to see, but on the very last coat, I did basically a true flood coat all the way around the perimeter where I let it run with a heavy bead of epoxy flowing down the edge. And that gives you a much nicer, more smooth or a smoother finish as opposed to using the trowel to basically scrape it up the edge and get it uniformly distributed because gravity doesn't fill trowels, the trowel uh, grooves when it's on the side nearly as well as when it's on the top. And I don't know if you can see it here in the reflection. Let me see if I can't there. Um, those little grooves right there are from the quick troweling that I was trying to do to patch a spot that didn't quite get the epoxy that it needed as opposed to this entire edge right here, which was one solid flowing coat. And so you can see it's a much more uniform finish and you don't have any of these stripies coming down on it. So don't use your trowel on the side. You waste a bunch of epoxy doing it unless you can try to catch it. You literally just want to flood it right over the edge so that you can see just this big ripple falling down the side. Okay, and last but not least, this is in the direction of the epoxy, but you really, really want to try and be good about this. Work in the cleanest possible environment. I ran into issues. If you can see any of these little tiny hot spots or these little reflected spots that come up right around in here, that is dust that fell into my finish. And if you're going to go through and sand this entire thing down and polish it back up, you won't run into this issue. Part of the challenge on why I didn't necessarily want to try and go down, sand this, and polish it back up is because you do get effectively a mirror finish everywhere minus those couple of surface defects and that adds basically an entire day of work to a table that is almost ready to go so if you can avoid dust in the surface like this or otherwise um, or your client doesn't care about it then um, you should be able to go and save yourself a ton of time. But really, 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 you need to try and work in the cleanest environment possible. Um, I had bugs flying around my shop and once or twice I had a mosquito that landed. I don't know why there's mosquitoes in the middle of winter here in Oregon, who knows? But there was a mosquito that landed right in the middle of my finish and I had to go pick it out with a uh, brad nail, just kind of pry it out and then smooth over that spot. But I had flies in the shop and I was just worried that this was gonna be the world's largest fly trap all the way across here. So. Work in the cleanest environment possible. If you've got a garage that's attached to your house, I mean, vacuum everything in the shop, blow everything off, make sure all your dust is filtered, run your air filter for a while so that you have nothing that can fall onto your finish. And then I even in the end, it's not up anymore, but I had a big plastic covering over the top of this so that anything that was in my rafters could not fall onto the table. 
So again, work in the cleanest environment possible. It's gonna go a long ways to towards giving you a great surface finish. Well, that was a ton of different things that I learned during this process and that wasn't even all of them. If you have any specific questions about what I did on this project or how I did this project, please leave it in the comment section down below. I love answering those questions. And a lot of times you guys think of things that I never even thought of or see something that I took for granted that I really needed to explain more. So please leave something in the comment section down below. Um, and I love having you guys around. So thank you tons. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this project. And if you haven't seen the rest of the build videos, this is the first video that you came across. Go ahead and check out the rest of them. I'll have them linked in the description. You can find them on the channel pretty easily. Um, I've got a whole playlist for this, for this table build. Um, and I learned an absolute ton on this and one of the reasons why it's not necessarily the professional how-to video all the way through is because I'm learning during this process and so I'm trying to share those lessons that I learned with you guys I'm not perfect this is not what I do as my day job so a lot of this is learning as I go um, and I'm just trying to share that with you so anyways thank you guys tons really appreciate it um, go make some sawdust unless you're finishing a table then get rid of all of that sawdust and have a great time talk to you later guys bye